Hello. Political history is in the making tonight with confirmation that the Speaker of the House of Commons is facing a challenge for his parliamentary seat. In about half an hour from now, Nigel Farage, a candidate for the UK Independence Party, will launch his campaign to unseat the Speaker, John Burko. Mr Farage will tear up parliamentary convention when his supporters gather at Buckingham. Our reporter Joel Mapp is there now. Joel. Yes, Susie, this is UKIP headquarters here in Buckingham. As you said, Nigel Farage is here, also the party leader, Lord Pearson. And they'll be uh, gearing up uh, at 7 o'clock for the launch of uh, Nigel Farage's uh, campaign here. But there's a very strange mood here in Buckingham at the moment. I've been here most of the afternoon. It's besieged with national interest, national media practically tripping over journalists. And yet many of the people here seem a little bit bemused. Most of them voted conservative last time, but this time many are only just realising that actually uh, they won't be able to vote for any of the three main parties. With its green fields and luxurious country estates, Buckingham has been one of the safest conservative seats in England, but this time there is no official Tory candidate. That's because of this man and his robes. As the Speaker, John Burko must stand this time as an independent and convention dictates that Labour and the Lib Dems will not oppose him. So the choice for voters is limited. Do you know that you won't be able to vote for any of the three main parties in Buckingham this time? No, I wasn't, didn't know about that, actually. Well, I think I should have a free vote to vote for either of them parties if I want to. We've done it every other year. I think it's poor. I think I should, you know, should I be able to put a vote, which is a major decision. UKIP candidate Nigel Farage is hoping to take advantage. Brandishing a symbol of old-fashioned independence, he spent the afternoon chatting to voters. Labour and the Liberal Democrats aren't standing against John Burko in the interests of Parliament. You are. Is it something of a cheap shot? You know, as recently as 1987, when Bernard Wetherill was Speaker, the two other parties stood against him in Croydon North. This idea that the other parties don't oppose the Speaker, is, it just shows you what a cosy consensus Westminster politics has become. This country has one of the largest budget deficits for generations. By concentrating on Europe, are you not showing you're a little out of touch? We are proposing that in year one, the next British government should cut spending by £50 billion. Pounds. Not the 6 or £10 billion that Labour and Conservatives are talking about, but £50 billion. Pounds. And we're saying that to do that, well, firstly, we stop paying away all this money to the EU, but secondly, we start to look at the massive growth in the public sector, particularly in Quangos, since Labour came to power. Most of them are completely unnecessary. They don't do any good for the productive part of the economy, and we would like to get rid of them. With a majority of over 18,000 last time around, John Burko will be difficult to beat. But the Speaker left his robes behind today and was out campaigning, worried enough to fight for every vote. Joel, has John Burko himself said anything about the UKIP challenge? Well, he's certainly been asked about it a lot by all those national media that have been here today. As I said, he has been out campaigning as well. And I managed to grab a quick word with him about it earlier. I'm standing on my track record over 13 years of battling effectively for this constituency, my continuing commitment to the Buckingham constituency and my determination to restore faith in Parliament. But of course I'm opposed by a ragbag of fringe candidates, four of whom don't have any historical track record in the constituency at all, no previous involvement, no previous interest, no previous commitment. Joel, in, in other seats in our region, UKIP said today they wouldn't be standing against some of the region's Conservatives. Why is that? Well, that's right, and it's perhaps a, a little of a surprise move, but these are three candidates who share some of UKIP's uh, Euroscepticism, and those candidates are Bob Spink in Castle Point, Douglas Carswell, uh, and also um, Philip Hollowbone in Kettering. Um, and I spoke to Nigel Farage about this earlier, and I put this to him, and he said we should be putting country before party. It is a real challenge, a real uh, mountain to climb. Um, it would be a miracle almost if he pulls it off, I have to say. So, Joel, I, I think uh, what, we did, what we did there was we, we jumped ahead of ourselves because that, I think, was going to be my next question. Moving on elsewhere in the campaign, there's been some surprise today at comments made by the outgoing Tory MP Malcolm Moss, hasn't there? 
Yes, that's right. Uh, he's had some comments about whether or not the Tories will be able to gain an outright, outright majority. Many uh, Conservatives have had a view on this, but perhaps not gone quite as far uh, as Malcolm Moss uh, has said today. And I hope we can hear that clip now. It is a real challenge, a real uh, mountain to climb. Um, it'd be a miracle almost if he pulls it off, I have to say. So. I think we've lost Joel. Problems, but uh, just to put that in, in just to put that in context, uh, Malcolm Moss clearly talking in the context of the electoral challenge that the Tories face. They need a, a big seven percent swing in that. So it just needs to be taken in context. Those comments. Joel, thank you very much. Despite our technical difficulties. And we asked the Conservatives about those comments by Mr Moss and a spokesman said we've never been complacent about this election and are fighting a positive campaign to win each seat. A reminder that details of all the candidates standing in Buckingham and all the other constituencies can be found on the BBC website. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash election. A million households in the Look East region are set to lose their signal which provides them with analogue television. It's part of the national switchover to digital broadcasting. Elsewhere in the country, these areas have already made the switch. These are the three transmitters in our region. The first change will be Sandy Heath in Bedfordshire. That will happen a year from now in April 2011. The digital switchover is the largest change in British broadcasting for over a generation. And now it's our region's turn to make the switch. The Sandy Heath transmitter serves just under a million homes here in the west of the region. But just 75% of those homes can receive free view with particular black spots in places like Luton. But when the digital switchover is complete, that figure will rise to just under 99%. And to achieve that, Sandy Heath's analogue signal will be switched off in stages for March next year, affecting viewers in Beds, Hearts, Bucks, Northamptonshire and Cambridgeshire. The Sudbury and Tackleston transmitters, which serve viewers in Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk, will be switched off at a later date. But why do we need to go digital? If you're an analogue viewer, you go from four or five channels, that's BBC One, two, ITV Channel Four, and possibly Channel Five, to a whole range of digital services, including all the other BBC digital services and some commercial channels as well. So it's, it's greater choice. Uh, you get radio channels as well, uh, widescreen pictures, better quality sound, uh, and things like audio description services. And Cambridge is already pioneering digital technology. This company designs interactive set-top boxes for the European market. And when the UK finally catches up, it hopes to do the same here. These are the types of services that we would like to bring to the UK. That's certainly the case. And uh, we're working with uh, designers and manufacturers of set-top boxes in the UK for Freeview and Freesat in order to bring these types of services to the UK, digital Britain. Switchover robot Digit Al was also in Cambridge today to publicise the change. And organisers will be hoping that next spring's switchover will run rather more smoothly than Digit Al's attempt at punting. Steer Dracliffe, BBC Look East, Cambridge. So what should you do between now and next April when the analogue service is switched off? Felicity Simper has been finding out. I bet it's been a while since you watched TV on a set like this. I'm not sure the poor old thing will even switch on anymore. But come next spring, when the digital switchover happens in our region, if you can't bear to part with your old analogue telly, it's going to need a bit of tarting up. So, what's the choice? Well, it all depends on how much cash you have to splash. The cheapest way if you want to keep your analogue TV is to buy a set-top box. They cost around £40. If you've already got one, then great, but it'll need retuning. With Freeview, you've got more stations. Instead of the normal four or five, you've got the uh, 30 stations, you've got news. Um, there's also obviously like bit better quality. Interactive buttons, you've got the Wimbledon can be shown with different uh, courts rather than just the same one. So quite a few advantages. You may get a letter offering you assistance from the switchover help scheme. For example, if you're 75 or over or registered blind, you could get help. If you're on income-related benefit, you get it completely free. But if not, for a one-off £40 fee, you'll get easy-to-use equipment, totally installed, and you'll have 12 months free assistance afterwards. The other option is to buy a new digital TV with Freeview built in. You can spend as much money as you like. Oh, TV heaven. 
Of course, if you've got a spare 13 grand to spend, you could buy one of these. I think I might struggle getting it in the boot of my car, though. Felicity Simper, BBC Look East. And if you want more information about the Switchover Help Scheme, you can ring 0800 408 7654 or visit the website at helpscheme.co.uk.